Good morning, everyone. Really uh, looking forward to today's conversation. Thank you for joining us on this Friday morning. I'm Pippa Elias. I'm the Deputy Director of the Environment Program at the Walton Family Foundation. Based in the D.C. area, where it's going to get hot today and the cicadas are out, and I can almost hear them in the background. Um, really so excited about the panel today, talking about a topic that I really believe is the closest connection that people have with the environment and with nature, which is agriculture. We all need to eat. And today we're going to hear from a panel of experts on how we can think differently about the future of food and agriculture and how it can become more sustainable and just. So we're going to start today with um, about 30 minutes of a panel discussion with our panelists and then open it up to Q&A from all of you. So feel free to start putting in questions into the Zoom Q&A feature um, or however you're connected, uh, send us your questions and we're, we're really looking forward to the discussion today. So I'm gonna jump right in. Thankfully, I think uh, all of you received uh, bios of our incredible panelists. So I'm just gonna go around um, with, with questions that are a little bit introductory and then we'll get into um, the heart of the discussion. So Kelly, I'll start with you. You're the director of the World Food Policy Center at Duke. You're a world-renowned expert in public health, nutrition, and, and obesity. Uh, can you share briefly the passion that has driven you throughout your career? Yeah, thanks, Pippa. Um, I appreciate the nice introduction. I'm really happy to be involved in this today. I saw yesterday I saw a list of the people who are participating in this event, I mean, the, the attendees, and what an impressive group that is. So thank you all for joining us, and, and uh, please know how much we appreciate it. Um, I came to Duke eight years ago after having been on the faculty at Yale University for more than 20 years um, to be the dean of the School of Public Policy. And during that time, we created a World Food Policy Center that turned out to be a really very interesting enterprise, at least for me, uh, because it allowed us to uh, do more than what I had done previously in my career, which is to focus on just one aspect of nutrition and public health. Um, and in this case, the World Food Policy Center has been meant to bridge different areas of food and food policy that previously have been disconnected. Uh, so for example, there's a world of people that work on obesity and public health and, and prevention, uh, they tend not to interact very much with the people that work on food insecurity. And that's a whole different set of individuals, organizations, institutions, et cetera. Um, and then if you look at agriculture and environment, that's yet another world. And because these worlds don't interact, it occurred to me and my colleagues early on that there's policy magic to be had at the intersection of these areas. And there, there's also a missed opportunity to, um, to, build a stronger coalition of voices arguing for change if you can bring people and institutions together across these areas. So that's what we set out to do was to bridge four fundamental areas of food, food and food policy. And I sort of have alluded to them already. One cluster is um, food insecurity, malnutrition, hunger, you know, called different things in different parts of the world. The second is obesity and overnutrition. That now affects more people worldwide than food insecurity. Uh, the third area is agriculture and environment. And the fourth area is food safety and food defense issues. And while it's been um, the most challenging thing I've ever done in my career, because it's hard to be good at one thing, much less understand all of these things, it's also been the most exciting. And so learning from people in agriculture and ag policy and things like that, working closely with people on food insecurity has been really exciting. So that's what motivates our center. Great, thank you. Um, I already have a lot of follow-up questions, but I'm gonna keep going with uh, the introduction. So uh, Corby, thank you so much for being here today. Um, as the executive director of the Food and Society Program at the Aspen Institute, as well as a journalist, editor, and author, um, you've had you know, global and just so many deep and rich experiences with communities and food and agriculture and how they all interact. Um, can you also tell us what your passion is that kind of brought you to, to your work? Well, you're very kind to ask. And given my incredible respect for Norbert and Kelly, I feel um, awkward saying anything. 
um, and everybody uh, at Duke. Um, the Aspen Institute has very warm connections to Duke, so I'm very honored to be part of this. Um, so at Food and Society, a policy program within the Aspen Institute, I get to work on, for example, safety guidelines for restaurant workers. My show and tell is my um, diner code of conduct. So this is about how to keep workers and diners safe as restaurants reopen. But you know, there's a lot to do with equity in that because for example, the new confusing masking guidelines, uh, some people can't get immunized, they have to wear masks. And so worker protection has been hugely important. Um, all kinds of equity, here is our cover. Um, my shameless, I'm very pleased about these restaurant safety guidelines, but it's protecting workers and diners and um, worker safety and pay time off for vaccination and sick leave have really been urgent issues during COVID and will continue to be urgent issues. Um, so to get to take a national stand on that, and we've been very lucky because the CDC Foundation has helpfully asked us to do trainings for public health officials and restaurant workers, uh, two separate sets of trainings for different audiences. So a lot of that will be about safety around workers. Um, food is medicine, Norbert, uh, my colleague at Tufts, I still call him my colleague at Tufts Friedman School. He has left for the greener pastures of Duke, but um, uh, we were doing work on food as medicine and nutrition interventions. They're all completely centered on, as Kelly has been working on, and Kelly is one of my North Stars in everything I do. Um, how do you think about equity issues in everything you do? So for food as medicine, we're doing a research priorities action plan. I will say people we share, it is the Walmart foundation that approached me for this, different from the Walton family, but uh, we're very grateful to them for a research priorities action plan. And our main focus is going to be on how to incorporate um, in matters of racial and community equity into research conception and design, not just implementation. So that has been fascinating. Um, and then um, the last thing I'll say is uh, the newest project we're doing is called Equitable Access to Equity, Clearing Paths to Ownership for BIPOC Food Entrepreneurs. So although it's not gonna be talking about farmland, which I will be talking about, it's talking about where, it's an interactive map of the US, enter your zip code, where are there credit options and loan opportunities for BIPOC food entrepreneurs of all kinds, caterers, restaurants, food service providers, and then where is their technical assistance because there's a mismatch. So in any case, passion, Norbert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. And um, I, I, again, start putting questions into the Q&A because I'm sure you're already coming up with them thinking about, yeah, those, those systems like the financial system that is so critical to change to get to where we wanna be. So, all right, and Norbert. A, a professor of food and economics, economics and community at Duke Divinity School, and you focus on food access, choice, and waste, both domestically and internationally. And I must say, in all my years of working in agriculture, as far as I know, you're the first ordained deacon and agricultural economist I've ever met. <laughs> it's even like ag economists are sometimes hard to come by. Um, so just it's so wonderful to, to hear from you today. And similarly, what, what's uh, your passion that brought you to your work today? Great, thank you, Pippa. And, and, and thank uh, the organizers for bringing us all together. And it's, it's such an honor to be with all of you. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with Corby and now with um, Kelly. So it's, um, it's in many ways, it's, it can be a really comfortable place to, to be with all of you. Um, but we're also going to talk about some complicated issues, and so I'm, I'm interested in, in engaging in this conversation. I'll, I'll, I'll start very personally. Uh, I'm originally from rural Georgia. I grew up in a place called Dawson, Georgia, and um, I went to predominantly Black schools um, in the South. And by the time I was in middle school or high school, uh, we were all receiving free lunch. I, I didn't think anything of it. It was just part of what was going on, and I didn't understand as a kid that that was an indication of, uh, well, it was the universal um, free lunch that was provided because of the, the level of poverty in my community. We have folks who were doing the best they could, good families trying to raise their children. And I'm grateful to, to the people in my community because I am who I am today because of them. 
but there were real challenges in the community. And it's, it's sometimes uh, something you don't understand until you leave. And so I go off to college and graduate school, interested in agriculture because I had been a 4 h -er for years. And 4 h is what got me into agriculture. And I'm grateful for the cooperative extension system and what it helped teach me in addition to other community members like the church. But I, I studied agriculture to you know, be a college professor. And, um, and I did the things that you were supposed to do. I, I, I engaged in research. I, I worked on international trade because um, I wanted to be helpful in that respect. Um, but I was a faculty member at Auburn, uh, Auburn University in Alabama. And I started looking around the community where I was. I got invited to be a part of a, or a conversation around food insecurity. And it was something I knew the word, but I didn't really understand I didn't understand at the time what it meant. Um, and then I realized, oh, oh, I do know what this is. Um, I understood it from my community in a way that was much more evident um, and real than just talking about it as an academic. That actually changed the work that I was doing. Um, at the same time, I was in the process of being ordained as a deacon in the Episcopal Church. And I knew of the, the work of early deacons and particularly this idea of serving at the table and I saw the, the confluence of these two things in my life. Um, so that's what brings me to this place. It's uh, the, the personal, the experience of my life, um, but then also the important policy conversations that we can have around these issues. Um, I, I think it was Kelly who said policy magic. I, I like that term. Um, and I think we, we, should, we, should, we should embrace that because there, is some, there are important places where um, who we are and our identity really matches and informs the policy discourse that should take place. Thank you. Um, and, and I'm also excited, Norbert, to get into some of the challenging conversations today. But first, I'm going to give a little shout out to 4-H. Uh, my daughter is a six-year-old 4-H'er. Um, so, all right. So can you, Norbert, can you provide us a little bit of framing today for our discussion and really um, help us think about how you define environmental justice as it relates to food and agriculture. Sure, great. So environmental justice um, is, has been a movement uh, that's gone on for a number of years. Um, some would you know, say it starts in the, the late 70s and early 80s. Um, Robert Bullard, who um, is a sociologist, is sometimes accredited as the father of environmental justice. Uh, because he began this work looking at um, the correlation between communities of color and industrial waste um, and the production of industrial waste. Um, at the same time, around the same time, here in North Carolina in Warren County, there uh, was a major protest uh, looking at or fighting against the placement of a waste facility that was going to deal with PCPs and soil. Um, and uh, African-Americans in the community fought back and protested and um, raised some attention to this issue. Um, they ultimately lost that particular fight, but it sparked a, a movement that brought in people like Benjamin Chavez to come in and um, begin that work. He was a part of the United, Ch uh, United Church, of Christ, uh, Church of Christ to, to further develop this idea of environmental justice. But environmental justice is not limited to just the space around industrial waste. Um, there have been a number of reports here at Duke, at UNC, and uh, lots of universities recognizing that agricultural um, practices uh, generate waste in terms of animal waste and also runoff from pesticides and, and fertilizers that affect um, communities broadly, but particularly communities of color, communities that happen to be in rural areas because of where agriculture is typically placed, um, but also particular communities uh, that suffer from poverty. And so it's the confluence of um, economic um, uh, disparities, um, health disparities, and uh, communities of color that we see food justice and environmental justice coming together. Um, I, I, my wife and I had some serious conversations around this. She's also here at Duke in the Divinity School and this idea of the sedimented inequalities that food justice and environmental justice sort of lays bare. So when I think about these issues, I, I see these things coming together in these important ways, if you will, the, the sedimented or intersectionality of these uh, features are important for us to consider. Yeah. 
um, interesting, right? Because Kelly really started with um, kind of the intersection of the right people and expertise to, to get us um, to, to the best policies. Um, and, and Kelly, one thing I'm really interested in in your work is, you know, how you think about what Norbert just laid out for us and what it means in terms of evolving and continuing to kind of bring the right people together and, and advance our thinking um, in terms of kind of the concept that drove a lot of food policy and philanthropy um, and charity in the past is, is food security. Um, how do you think about reframing that in a way that's more centered around justice? So people, when we um, began our work uh, at Duke on the, with the World Food Policy Center, we were committed to, to working in North Carolina as well as around the world, uh, but to, to try to make a difference in, in our local communities. So we've been doing work now going back about four years in uh, rural North Carolina and also especially in Durham, the city where we live. Uh, that work has been very interesting. It's been completely humbling. It's been one of the most educational things that's ever happened to me and my colleagues as well, because we've been deeply uh, involved in relationships with people in the community. And um, we've developed a whole different approach to things than the way we started out. Well, the way we started out was we hoped to work with communities to create what we call model food communities, where you could try to get everything right to the extent possible to help address the various food issues that we've discussed earlier. But people in the community pretty quickly said, well, whose model is this? And uh, once we started to think about, well, maybe it should be the community's model, the people in the community come up with much different solutions than what we, we had ourselves. And um, it, it's interesting to think about this in a broader context about the way the country has handled the issue of food insecurity. You know, going, the, the country got really serious about food insecurity in the late 1960s. And one of the things that stimulated this was a very famous film, a documentary that was on CBS, I believe, called Hunger in America, and brought a lot of attention to the issue. Um, and then uh, some prominent political people, Bobby Kennedy in particular, went, in, went out and did a tour of um, rural uh, Appalachia and other parts of the country and brought even more attention to it. So the country said, boy, there's a problem here and we should really do something about this. Uh, now, certainly hunger had existed before. You have you know, bread lines in the depression and things like that, but the real serious approach to it kicked in in the late 1960s. And what evolved from that was a model of charity. And, and of course it makes perfect sense. If people are hungry, they should, they should get food. And let's find, let's develop programs and ways for them to get this food. So food banks then ramped way up, soup kitchens, food pantries, and the, the charitable food programs uh, like what's now SNAP uh, came into being. And uh, lots of people were getting lots of help in lots of ways. And many people were working on this and trying to make these programs as effective as possible. Now, what never really happened too much along the way was questioning of the fundamental model of does it make sense to provide, to, to help people with, with food insecurity with a model of charity, where basically people within the power structure um, are saying to people who don't have enough food, we're going to give it to you. Uh, it's going to be up to us to establish the policies. It'll become a political football forever, uh, and the, the benefits will be threatened. Um, we, we can make it harder or easier to sign up for the benefits. It'll never really be enough to feed your family, but here's the best we can do. And it really kind of maintains the power dynamic and doesn't help communities all that much. I mean, it's enormously, these programs are enormously beneficial, don't get me wrong, but they, they don't really help establish much economic development in the communities because a lot of the money flows through the communities. People go outside their communities to a Walmart or a Kroger or somewhere like that to buy the food uh, to some extent. And there's no opportunity to build a sustainable and resilient food system within the community if there's this constant rely reliance on charity. And the, if you look at the people around the country who are working on food insecurity, most of them are trying to make charity better. Um, and of course, if, you're, if that's your fundamental system, you want it to be as good as possible. So thank goodness people are doing that work. 
But you could also challenge a fundamental model and, and say, well, what about food justice and food resiliency and food sustainability in communities rather than a model of insecurity? So just as a thought experiment, what if over these years, some of that money that's gone into the SNAP program had been invested in communities to build their own food system in ways that they would deem responsive to the problems that exist in the communities, not government, not foundations, not universities, but the communities themselves, would we have a more sustainable and resilient food system now than, than we have otherwise? And I don't know the answer to that, but we think it's really important to begin investing in communities. And there's tremendous resourcefulness and creativity going on in communities around the country, some of it happening right here in Durham, but there's not enough investment in it. So you can't, we don't really know how well those things work or how they can be replicated, et cetera, without that kind of investment. So that's one of the things that we're working on is moving from models of charity to models of resilience and justice. It's so powerful. Thank you, Kelly. And I think, um, you know, I'll just uh, <laughs> I'll just go straight to the part of the heart of the matter in policy, right? Which is the the feeling that this kind of food issue is an urban issue and agriculture is a rural issue. But um, I think Corby, you know, unfortunately, COVID has shown us the depths of hunger across our entire country. Um, it's not just kind of a, an urban issue, and the parts of our food system that um, are fragile uh, and and kind of weren't prepared for for what we we just faced and are facing. So. Um, can you tell us from you know the extensive uh, travel and research you've done, kind of some of the other agriculture and food related injustices in the U.S. and particularly what you've seen in rural areas? Boy, has COVID exposed a lot of fault lines. And when Kelly talks about the resilience of the food system, the brittleness of the supply chain that saw millions of animals slaughtered and billions of eggs destroyed because the companies that were uh, set up to supply big institutions suddenly lost their customers and they couldn't repackage the goods to go into retail and supermarkets where the shelves were empty. So the supply chain is a huge problem. Um, Hub and Spoke and food hubs and Kelly and Norbert, what happened to our favorite food hubs under Kathleen Merrigan at USDA? That was gonna be a big national um, impulse to help increase access to smaller and medium size to be um, realistic uh, farmers to supermarkets and large uh, suppliers and wholesalers that ordinarily didn't have the infrastructure, you know, huge pickups and loading docks. How did you get small trucks to the farmers? So. There's been a very, there have been big systemic obstacles to getting your supply to the markets you need. So that has been its own kind of injustice. I think an environmental injustice aspect that has been insufficiently studied, and I have great hopes under Tom Vilsack's return to USDA, will be pollution and agricultural runoff and the decades of redlining of farmland that have led mostly African-American farmers that the only farmland they could afford was around huge CAFOs, the concentrated animal feedlot operations and hog pig barns. And when I was in Iowa, I would go and I would see um, shuttered houses next to these enormous industrial fans. Have you ever seen these big windowless warehouses of hogs, you must have seen them with those really scary science fiction exhaust fans. And they're exhausting manure and aerosolized pollution where aerosolized is now something we've been very aware of in COVID transmission. But that was going to often African-American farmers because the only farm land they'd been able to afford was right around these CAFOs. So that has to be changed. And I think the USDA has been aware of this. It's taken some steps, not enough. So I'm looking forward to um, much more access to farmland from farmers who have been shut out of a system they never should have been shut out. There's a, you know, there's been a million articles about this. One of them was the 949,000 black farmers in a 1920 census 
down to like 45,000. So it's 1.3% black farmers now. It's, it's shocking. And that of course is just decades of controlled and reduced access to farmland and to economic uh, assistance programs. Thank you so much, Corby. Um, so I'm gonna ask one more question here. We're, we're getting to about half an hour in um, that I just can't help myself. And hopefully all of you all can answer. Uh, but you know, please, uh, those who are with us today, start to submit your questions in the Q&A. Um, we, we have um, just so much depth of expertise here. I think you, know, you can probably ask anything. Um, so I, I wanna ask all of you, I, it, something that you all have brought up is kind of, again, these the need for relationships and for different experts to talk to each other, to form the right policy for relationships with communities and, and their voice in shaping um, their own future. So um, when we think about kind of the, the next step in elevating environmental justice in food and ag policy, what are some um, relationships that maybe don't exist today? Who are some people um, who we need to hear from more. If you could kind of wave a magic wand and have a new colleague who, who worked on something, you know, who, who would you bring in? Who do you think isn't at the table today who needs to be? So I don't know if, uh, who wants to start? Corby looks like he's thinking. So maybe I'll start with, uh, with well, Norbert. I'm thinking that Norbert and Kelly are going to have good ideas about this. Yeah. But I will say that some of my heroes, um, run African-American farmer associations. And uh, what Kelly said earlier about the community, one of the lessons in humility we're learning in our food is uh, medicine priorities action plan for research is you cannot assume you know what communities want. And if you think you've identified just what the problem is and you've got some great ideas about upstream community investment, that might not be the kind of community investment they want. And you cannot speak for people without knowing what they actually feel. And so in new USDA deliberations, um, there are wonderful uh, uh, community programs at Aspen Institute who've been doing this work for years, but um, I would like them included at the table at the beginning. And I bet Norbert and Kelly have specific ideas, not general. Well, I'm, I'm happy to chime in and to build on what Corby said. Um, the, it's only been recently that there's been any recognition at all of the importance of community voices, and it still feels pretty tokenized to me in many cases. If you know, I, I, I take part in lots and lots of meetings on food and nutrition and public health and things, and now people from community organizations are getting invited, but it might be one person of 50 at the meeting. Um, and maybe you're, that person has a voice, maybe not, but it's certainly not a significant voice. And so we need to go beyond that tokenism and really listen to what people in communities have to say. And the only way to do that is develop deep and trusting relationships with such individuals because communities have a long history of not trusting government, not trusting uh, universities, not trusting philanthropies and things like that because it's been, uh, th there's been wealth transfer in these interactions. People benefit from these interactions, but it's not generally the community. It's the, you know, the people who get their grants or their publications, or they, they get feel good points for making policies and things, but so little of uh, meaning is left behind in communities that it's easy to see why people are, are skeptical. So just spending time with people in communities and developing developing those trusting relationships and being open-minded about hearing from people in the communities can be really very powerful. As I said, some of the most powerful experiences I've had in a long time. And my colleague, uh, Jen Zuckerman, who leads up a lot of our, our local work in Durham and elsewhere in North Carolina, uh, talks about the importance of showing up and just kind of being there. And those that's the way to help start making these relationships so we can really hear what people in communities say. And as I mentioned before, there's unbelievable creativity uh, and ingenuity going on in, in local communities, but it's not heard, it's not supported enough. 
one of the things I wanted to pick up on that I should have said at the beginning when talking about this idea of environmental justice, um, that it has often been the case, there's evidence to suggest that the location of environmental harms are frequently in places not only where there's um, poverty, but also places where there's little or limited political voice. Um, it's not that people don't want to do, uh, but for whatever reason, for whatever circumstances, their voices are not often heard. And, and just as has been discussed, this idea of hearing from these um, individuals, hearing from communities, listening and understanding and actually incorporating their ideas into the work that we do is important. Um, I was as preparing for this, I, I came across an article, a law review article um, relating the idea of connecting food policy councils and um, environmental or environmental justice movement efforts. And so food policy councils are localized efforts to address food issues. And they can range from anything from encouraging local foods, they're dealing with food insecurity and trying to use that as a means of connecting to environmental justice issues around food and agriculture. And that there could be this synergy if you brought these two, I, I'll, I'll even use Kelly's language of policy magic that could actually happen. And I will say I've had experiences with organizations trying to do something similar to that. And I will say, um, and I got to give credit to um, Danielle uh, Purfoy, who um, wrote this piece. One of the things I want to help think about is how difficult it can be for those different groups to come together. Um, while there are great intentions, um, the policy coherence sometimes is a little bit tricky. Um, because different groups have different orientations and they want certain things. And while there are some important places where they overlap, they do have differences. And it's about helping organizations and groups find ways of finding the wins that they can jointly share um, to move the agendas forward. So um, I, I think there's a lot of potential of bringing people to the table. Um, yes, pun intended. Uh, but bringing them to the table to find those places of compatibility uh, to move for greater access to food, to greater access to nutritional uh, food, but also doing it in a way that allows for sustainability, not just for today, but for the long run. Yeah. Well, and so, so that, that last little piece about, you know, kind of the long run, I'll just, I'll ask a selfish question here, but, you know, again, I think the audience should should chime in, um, put, put your questions into the Q&A feature on Zoom. But, um, you know, in philanthropy, we're often thinking about, um, the duration, right? How long, um, you know, we, we want to invest in communities and in our work for the time that's necessary and <laughs> like not quick processes. Um, but sometimes it can feel like there's a disconnect between the time it takes to develop these relationships and hear from communities and find those that common ground among communities who, of course, we, we all have different priorities and policy, right? We've got these like, policy windows right now there's like a very cool you know at federal level I think a lot of our audience here today is you know obviously DC based uh federal uh folks you know we have you know a few months um left to whether it's the infrastructure package and how we get agriculture in there or we're already gearing up for the next farm bill and we're always on these kind of quicker cycles um so how, how do we how do we bring these two together really the time it takes to work with communities and um, and build those relationships and kind of the policy making cycle. So how do we make that magic happen? In my, in my belief, it requires some initial investment in establishing these relationships, uh, not only money investment, but time investment. And once the relationships exist, then something can happen pretty quickly because people start to look at things differently. And I can give you a concrete example. So there are, uh, there are places around the country that uh, will have things that have various names like veggie vans, where somebody will outfit a truck uh, to drive around in, in communities in need uh, to provide fruits and vegetables at low cost to residents of the communities. Now, the, the typical model for that would be uh, some NGO, uh, probably outside the community, uh, would request money from a white-led organization like a philanthropy uh, and get money to outfit the van to drive it around. The van would not be parked in the community in the evening. Uh, the person who drives the van probably doesn't live in the community. And to the extent any wealth gets generated in this, like the job of driving the van, 
it doesn't reside in the community. It's outside the community and the community doesn't own it. So instead of an NGO doing this, what if the philanthropy gave money to the community? So somebody in the community could have uh, developed some credit worthiness. That goes back to redlining that got mentioned earlier that created housing deserts, food deserts, credit deserts and things. So, some, so it would be seen as, as uh, having sprung from the community and it's owned by the community, it's visible in the community and the wealth remains in the community. But that requires a different way of thinking. I wouldn't have thought about that before I, we started developing these relationships. So I think for philanthropies and other in government and things like that, the time it takes to establish these relationships is worth every second that it takes and worth every dollar that's invested. Corby, Norbert, anything to add there? I, I would say I'm often um, frustrated by cycles that I think probably people who are joining us today have much more insight into and ideas about than I, which is, um, you know, an enlightened mayor can start a food policy council that's very interested in issues of equity. And for example, bringing in rural, bringing in farmers from the food shed around a city. And uh, involving a whole section of a state, as I saw happen in Boston and uh, parts of Massachusetts that had not been brought into talks with Boston about how to have access to those markets. Then another mayor comes in and it's got to be crime or education. These are all urgent issues. They, they can't be ignored. But how does either philanthropy or a policy, for example, set aside in a farm bill that have often been pretty good about environment and water resources, from what I know, you'll have better ideas of that than I, but they look like they're built for the long term. So if, for example, the farm bill says this is going to be a 10 year project and we need to fund this for 10 years, and it's going to be uh, environmental justice and African-American farmers or tribal lands or any of the scanted groups that need more attention. Having a longer timeline, you know, is ideal. But of course, everybody who knows political realities knows how short these uh, timelines and considerations usually are. So I would invite everybody on this call to think of solutions around the short timeline. Anything to add, Norbert? My only addition to this is it's not even a, a solution. It's just also adding to the frustration that academics who get involved in this work um, often are fo forced to deal with short timelines, either because of funders or because of tenure and promotion clocks that you've got to get things done by a certain time or it all blows up. But it is about creating and I'm going to pick up on what Kelly is suggesting, this idea of a deeper investment with individuals who have that long view. If, if those are the ones getting that funding, they can take it and, and work in their community and see this through as opposed to the academic or the politician who's working off a short time frame because the next election is coming up in two or six years or whatever the case may be, or the academic who's worried about the next grant. But if we can truly find ways of investing in communities, folks who are embedded in those communities who, who see themselves there and their progeny there in the future, those are the folks who really can do the work that I think many of us who kind of come in and go out maybe can't. Right. A great lesson from agriculture, right? Because um, you know, from an environmental perspective, no matter kind of what agriculture looks like and the ways we can improve it, almost every farmer I know is thinking about passing the land on to their kids, um, which again also has a lot of historic and systemic inequities in it, as as Corby mentioned, and still today. Um, but that, that you know, we think about that obviously in terms of you know across the food system uh, all the way from the farmer up are people who are, like you said, invested in, in multiple generations. And if I can add Norbert and Kelly and now you have brought up generational wealth transfer and the obstacles and 
of dying intestate and not being able to apply for a serial number from the USDA that would entitle you to a lot of assistance uh, and important benefits. So generational wealth transfer is huge. And as Norbert and Kelly say, will result in you know, much broader uh, improvement. Um, so I'm glad you're working on it, Pippa. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, again, everyone feel free to add some questions. I have a question. I'm just going to have to read it because I am a soil scientist. So you guys can can answer this. <laughs> All right. Do you see a need to move beyond a neoliberal capitalist perspective in order to build the political will to end hunger? Let's start with you, Kelly. <laughs> you look ready. <laughs> no, no. The re reason I was nodding, I was looking at Norbert, given that they, I would you know, look the sort of neoliberal thing is so much, uh, you know, their economics is such an important part of that. And that's Norbert's training and background. And he's an economic expert. I thought I would defer to him. Great. All right. Let's start with you then, Norbert. I was really hoping to dodge that bullet. Uh, now, um, <laughs> Because this uh, the neoliberal critique of capitalism is is one that many fields bring to the table and say this is what's wrong with our society um, and and I would argue capitalism this idea of goods and services being exchanged and that there being a price for them um, does have many benefits um, the way we distribute goods through economic systems. Um, isn't inherently bad, but what ends up happening is that we deal with people who sometimes are more concerned about their own well-being uh, than the well-being of the community. And so I, I guess what I would argue um, is that we have to really be careful about um, all of our intentions and the way we work and how we value one another. Um, so I'm not going to I'm not going to say, oh, if we just got rid of capitalism, we would get rid of this problem. And I, I hope I'm not mischaracterizing or simplifying the question. I, I don't mean to disrespect it in that way. But I guess what I'm trying to argue is that there are issues of, of, of who we are as people that allows us to undervalue the other. Um, and, and that's what I think is really at the core of this issue. Um, Hunger is a challenge. Food insecurity is a continuous challenge that the crazy thing is there's plenty of food being produced here in the U.S. Um, the fact that there are communities that struggle to have access to that food is a reflection of the economic systems that allow for individuals to be underpaid or not receive a pay that allows for them to meet their family's food needs. Um, the fact that we end up leaning towards charity to solve this problem as opposed to what governments may or may not can do. I think the bottom line is we as society have to make choices. Uh, we have to decide whether or not we're going to fix these problems. And regardless of what the economic systems we use to, to get at that, it's about the political will that we choose to do something different. I mean, I think it's possible, but I also recognize that we have a lot of competing interests. And so we've got to make that a priority in order to solve that problem. Corby and Kelly, I saw a lot of nodding. Um, any, anything to add? I think that's a, such an interesting question from a theoretical point of view, and it leads to lots of um, potential scenarios. And um, I'm always trying to get my arms around what the current economic and political realities are and then how to maneuver with it, those. Um, and so I look to people like Kelly and Norbert to explain reality to me. You know, what, what came to mind as I was listening to, to Norbert and now to, to Corby answer what, answer what I also agree is a really interesting question is I think capitalism might work pretty well here as long as everybody has equal access to it, or at least some access to it. You know, when we talked about uh, generational wealth, uh, you know, that what we found in communities is that people that want, want to uh, start food-related entrepreneurship businesses have trouble getting even the smallest loans to do it. Uh, they, you know, their families don't have the money to lend them as, as others might. Um, and the huge they family and friends obstacle. People yeah. of color do not have family and friends often. There has to be a solution to that. Well, they have plenty of family and friends, but just not with enough resources to, 
to help them get started with these businesses. So the, um, <clears throat> and what we find when we talk to lending institutions is they say, it's easier for them to give out a $10 million loan than a thousand dollar loan. And the, the rules are better written and, and it's easy to establish credit worthiness when people are asking for, I mean, it's easier to then when people are asking for smaller loans. So, um, you know, what, what if those credit rules changed in some ways and the, the wealth could start to get getting generated within communities because lending institutions could act differently in providing money for people to start businesses that they think will be important so that the person who owns the veggie van is somebody from the community and the generational wealth can begin there. And in that case, I think the capitalism might work pretty well, but people have to have access to it. Yeah, Corby, you, you had mentioned loans earlier and um, again, from, from my more kind of sustainability and conservation perspective, this is something we're thinking about too, where, you know, agriculture loans that farmers need to take out, you know, every year just to operate, um, don't always take into consideration the financial benefits that some conservation practices uh, provide. So we'd we'll be really interested, you know, because you had mentioned this, you know, what, what the work you all are doing is related to, to finance and the food system and opportunities to, to shift policy. There's this world of, I'm sure everyone on this call knows, community development finance institutions, and they're incredibly lofty and good goals when they were formed. But what I'm hearing, and I will learn much more about because I only know enough to be dangerous now, is the red tape that grew up around applying for these loans that is often um, such a hurdle uh, that people who might apply for the possible financial assistance are very uh, intimidated or put off by repayment terms. And so they're not able to avail themselves of this. And then um, often it's not only the technical assistance required to get them through those hurdles to get the loans, but then managing business plans for the first two years of operation. And so understanding much more about those hurdles and how to um, overcome them is what we're looking to do in our equitable access to equity project. Norbert, did you want to jump in here? All right, all right. So we have another another question. Um, really appreciate all these questions. So please please keep adding them. This is great. So what are ways that you think about bringing folks from the communities that, that we're referring to um, into positions of power, um, the, similar to the ones that, that you all are in that we're all in, um, to shape policies themselves with and for their communities. Norbert, why don't you jump in first? I'd say what's one of the things that's really important in um, engaging folks in communities is um, spending time um, and actually getting to understand the, the, the lived experiences of those individuals. Um, it is too easy to, to assume you know what the problems are and to assume you know what the solutions are, um, but it takes that kind of honest and open um, engagement with the other to, to actually learn. Um, I, I think it's also an important lesson that um, those of us who are coming from the outside who may be more experienced with policy or policy formation um, can also share that knowledge. Um, the, the longer I am uh, a faculty member, the more I realize the importance of mentoring um, and helping people understand and navigate systems that exist. Um, we live in a political system we, if you're at a university, you live within a university that has a tenure promotion system that you need to understand or how to write the papers. You have to understand that that is not knowledge that just you discover on your own. It takes mentoring and it takes, um, it takes guidance. And so I think where the, the key thing is, is understanding there is knowledge within communities of what's there and the assets that are available but there's knowledge from outside about some of the policy development that people from the outside can bring in. And it's about bringing those together and finding equitable uh, working relationships that allow both groups to benefit in terms of sharing the knowledge um, and then learning what's there. So it's, it's about openness. And I would dare argue 
humility. Um, and I, I, it's easy to say these things, but it's really hard. And I keep bumping into um, the challenge of being humble uh, and, 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 and remembering uh, the circumstances that various people are in. You know, if, if I may, this, this is a really, really good question and, and a profoundly important one. Um, just yesterday in my mail, I got the latest issue of the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Uh, and the lead article was, was, or one of the lead articles was about decolonizing your board. Um, and boy, you know, that kind of thing is really important because it, it, it's, it's one thing to to recognize that community voices need to be heard. And it's, it's yet another one to take that information seriously and do something with it. It's a whole nother kettle of fish to have the decision-making and the power shared um, between various parties, including the communities. And so that's why the, the word relationships has come up so often in this conversation. It's not just listening listening to the communities and then we make the decisions. It, the communities can make the decisions, but, but they need help and they need support. And so institutions like universities can provide research support and technical support and communications uh, capacity and things like that, that the community organizations may not have, but, but the work needs to be seen as emanating from the communities and belonging to the communities. And that's, it's the community's intellectual property um, when, when they come up with solutions to these things. And institutions can be there to support, but it needs to be done as a real partnership in order for power to be better shared. You know, I, I'd like to come back to something Norbert said. He said it in passing as if it's something we all know and know how to implement, but it's such a crucial first step, which is the honesty and quality of the engagement. And learning how to conduct that engagement, it's a lifelong process for me, Norbert, so all tips welcome, but we understand that everything begins there. Um, and then until we have a much better idea, we can't get away from the tokenization Kelly talked about, the actual equalization of power within a room. Um, but that's something we all have to examine ourselves very deeply to try to understand better. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I'll, I'll just add here really quickly from the philanthropic perspective, obviously um, our, our, oh, our power is uh, money. And just thinking not only about who gets money, but the structure of what that looks like, um, which, uh, yeah, I'll just say it right now is very skewed to um, a certain kind of organization that knows how to deal with financial and legal systems and, you know, related to policy. And then I'll, I'll wrap up with just kind of asking you all maybe a little bit of a wish list of, of what you would love to see changed maybe in this administration. But, um, you know, as a, as a, as a uh, foundation, we cannot fund advocacy and lobbying, but we have worked to fund communication to policymakers. And actually just in doing that have had so many um, humbling lessons in even how to shape a communications training and just constantly being open to um, not only shifting um, that power in the way that we can legally in terms of, um, of bringing political power to others, but um, doing it and doing it in a way that actually works and isn't just our idea of how we think we should do it because we're people based in DC and so, you know. Um, all right, so then, you know, we've, we've just got seven minutes here. Um, really appreciate, again, everyone joining us, the organizers. So I'll just kind of um, ask you all, I'll start with you, Corby, just because you're on the left of my screen, um, just what you would love to see um, in, let's just say, the next few years. Uh, we'll, we'll bring it back down to that super quick policy timeline, even though we know the problems with that. What's your wish list related to food, agriculture, and, and environmental justice? I've got the vaguest, most uninformed hopes and ambitions, but they are these, that the administration, which has all the right priorities and I couldn't be more heartened and encouraged by, is able to prioritize practicality and nuts and bolts ability to translate those priorities 
into action for people who need it. Uh, if they identify funds of economic assistance that they are basing on equity, that they find the ways to reach the people who can best use it um, and make the resources available to those people to understand how to use it and how to continue to benefit. So that's a lot, but they have come in saying things that I think we've hoped to hear for a long time from an administration in power. And now it's, it's translating it on the ground to the people who need to benefit from it. Thanks. All right, Norbert, I'll turn to you. Thank you. And the, the hope that I have for this current administration is that they are able to keep moving forward on climate smart policies for agriculture, um, but also encouraging and supporting uh, farmers of color, well, farmers of all backgrounds, but particularly uh, farmers of color who have been left out of the system. And we talked about this at the top of the program, where we see that African American farmers particularly, but other farmers of color have been in a decline um, at a tremendous rate um, because of unfair practices um, that aren't just USDA based, but across uh, our society. So if we are able to find ways of helping encourage uh, this diverse group of farmers to meet not just national needs, but even local needs, creating opportunities for individuals of various backgrounds to get into agriculture, to expand that workforce, um, to represent the communities that they are actually feeding. Those are, those are the things I really do hope for. Um, and I guess in a, another side, I'll say maybe not on a policy side, but it's this idea of engaging people who had not considered environmental issues important um, to help them see their role in it. I, I will just say on a personal note, when I was a, a student um, in graduate school, I often saw the environmental movement as one that was predominantly a, a white concern. Um, it was interesting because as I was a student, I also knew of the environmental justice movement, but it wasn't one that was sort of embraced in a broad way, at least as I understood it in my narrow experience. And I think it's about engaging a broader audience to say a healthy environment, um, one that is addressing the climate challenges that we're facing is affecting all of us. And more importantly, probably will have bigger effects on communities of color and communities that experience economic um, uh, inequality. And understanding that, I think we're gonna see a broader group of folks come in and be a part of these conversations and are gonna be ones who are gonna fight for change in a way that I think folks outside those communities cannot or will not. So those are my hopes. Thank you, Norbert. All right, Kelly, turn to you. So um, I'm really heartened by the, the amount of attention and resources our country places toward addressing food insecurity. And this was even more apparent than ever during COVID when a lot of people stepped forward to do really heroic things to help people who, who had even more severe problems with food insecurity. What I'm hoping is that, that the country can pause and really think through the charity-based model and what it represents how it came to be, uh, who benefits from it at the end of the day, um, and whether it's really serving the needs that it's meant to. And uh, of course, we need to make it as effective as possible, but I think there's also some fundamental questioning of the model that can be done. And I think government is in a good position now to think about, can investments be made differently to take a different approach? Um, you know, maybe as an alternative to the cherry based model to test it out and see how well it works. And that would be direct investment in communities, counting on community resources and resourcefulness um, and, and supporting um, solutions that don't necessarily come from the top down. Thank you. So, so inspiring. What um, a wonderful start to the weekend um, on this Friday morning. Um, so, you know, please um, feel free to reach out to the organizers with any additional questions and, and they'll get back to our panelists. And uh, they will be sharing a recording with all of you. And I think this is the beginning of a series that, that hopefully is um, engaging and useful to all of you. So thank you, Kelly, Norbert, Corby, um, I, I'm so honored to be part of this and uh, really appreciate uh, your time uh, and all that you guys do every day um, to, to work on these critical issues. So 
have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pippa, for doing such a good job.